And now comes the concluding part of the evening, where each of our candidates uh, will have an opportunity to present a three-minute closing statement. We've had the opportunity to come to know you all better throughout this evening, and now you may speak about yourself. In the order of rotation, as it will now take place, it will be Mr. Pollard, Mr. Dunlap, Mr. Hill, and Mr. Hayden. Three minutes for each closing statement. We begin with you, Mr. Pollard. Thank you, Mr. Dunlap. Thank you, Mr. Hayden. Thank you, Mr. Dunlap. So, as all of you know, we are living in extremely difficult times right now, in America and in the world. And here, at home, people are out of work. The homeless shelters are overflowing. The soup kitchens and the food pantries are unable to meet the demand for their services. The recession that we've been in the midst of, there's talk of abatement, but many people are not feeling that, and, and there is not a clear sense that we are out of the woods by any sense. Around the world, there is violence in so many places. In Syria, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, throughout the Middle East and Central Asia. I met a couple of men from Africa at the Reverend Pastor Martin Luther King's breakfast, and they told me about the, the epidemic of rape, which is happening in the Congo right now. And I learned from a report that it's estimated that 400,000 women This is uh, sexual violence is being used as a weapon of war throughout the world. This is unacceptable to us as human beings. We need to put an end to this immediately. Meanwhile, we're destroying the last remaining native forests. The last polar bears are starving to extinction. The last tigers are being hunted by poachers, so their body parts can be sold in black markets. However, when I was born, my friends, friends of my parents made a tapestry for me. And it's hung on my bedroom wall ever since I was born. And my first name is Justin, and I went by Justin until seven years ago when I decided to start going by my middle name, which is Benjamin. And the sign, the tapestry, it, it says, Justin Pollard, September 16th, 1972. And there is an image of a, a rising sun, halfway risen. And it says, a new day is coming. And these are words that I've looked at all my life. And I've <coughs> heard and I've believed them. And, and I believe them now. And this is why I'm running for the United States Senate, is because I would like to help us as a human race, as Americans, as citizens of the world, to bring about a new era, uh, to make a transition to a culture of peace and ecological and I'd like to end with a quote. The, the, I am an optimist, the alarm may go off. Um, but this is a quote from Robert Kennedy, my hero. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or asks to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, these ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Thank you very much. To be strictly fair in the important business of final statements, I think perhaps it would be fairest to extend uh, three minutes and 30 seconds to each of those who shall now uh, follow. In the next uh, speaking of uh, Slot is Mr. Dunn. Well, thank you. On this campaign trail, I've talked an awful lot about my daughter, Emily, who's 11, and how important she was in the decision for me to, to run for this, and the decision to focus on making her world better and stronger and have a brighter future for her. She's a great kid. She's got a big heart. She's a lot of fun to be around. And I've had the best time of my life being her father. I think, too, about another young lady named Kate, Kate Leon, who you may not know and I've never met.
she was 14 years old. And where she worked, uh, the supervisors had bolted the doors so that the girls wouldn't sneak out and take breaks they weren't supposed to be taking. And when the place caught fire, the only choice that she and 145 of her co-workers had was to either burn alive or jump 14 stories to their deaths. And that happened 101 years ago, just this month, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York City. And what happened after that was changes to the labor laws within, the New, York, within New York City, and then further, that became the bedrock of the comprehensive worker reforms that took place during the New Deal, and it protected us for 70 years. And what I see now is that the Republicans are, have not disguised their intent to go back to those days, to reverse all those reforms. Because what they'd like to see is a time before workers had any say in their working environment, their ability to collectively bargain for worker safety conditions, not to mention their pay and their health. Child labor laws, uh, women's rights, all these things are find their, their bedrock in the firmament of those early changes to the law. There are those who believe, people who've been talking around this campaign, that what we need to go do is go down there and bridge these differences and meet each other halfway. Well, meeting the Republicans halfway still takes us backward. And I don't believe that we need to see a repeal of things like the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and if you think that's not happening, just remember the election of last year, um, the people's veto on the, uh, on the election day registration question, uh, they are very, very serious about making it harder for people to vote and be engaged in our democracy. I want to go forward. I want to protect people, workers and their families. I want to fight for comprehensive health care. I want to see that, uh, see that tax reform take place so that people can actually have a reliable government that is stable. Um, what may need is a voice for working people in the Senate, not another millionaire, not somebody who's going to go down to Washington and just wheel and deal for the sake of wheeling and dealing. We need a real Democrat, a Democrat who will fight for democratic values. And same manner that Ed Muskie and George Mitchell did. And um, like them, I mean, I was born in Maine, I grew up in Maine, I have very, very deep roots here. And I was educated in Maine, I've made my, my home here, my life here, I'm raising my family here. I am committed to the future of this state, and that's why I want to go down to the United States Senate and represent you and make America better and stronger so that we can have more prosperity, not less, and stop the foolishness that's been going on there for far, far too long. Thank you very much. Three minutes, 30 seconds. Final closing statement. Ms. Dill. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. And thanks to my colleagues and to Representative Adams and to Mr. Glenn. It's been a, a cold, but a very uh, interesting and uh, informative evening. And I would just ask you going forward to keep an open mind. There's four Democrats here. Those of you who are registered Democrats will go into the voting booth on June 12th and select one to be your Democratic candidate. And there's going to be a lot of conversations and campaigning that will take place over the coming weeks. And so what I'd like to just introduce uh, to you tonight is, um, or invite you to do, is to keep an open mind and to pay attention. Um, everybody is, is, uh, is unique and offers different um, qualities and personalities skill sets. And what I would offer to you as a Democratic candidate is somebody who has a track record of winning campaigns. I think it's important that the Democrats choose someone who's electable and has appealed the ballot box. I think if you look at the history of my elections, um, I've done very well in the face of various, um, you know, an ambush by the Republican Party, essentially. Um, in terms of legislation, I have a record of accomplishment. I've worked across party lines to achieve good things <coughs> as a state senator, and I will represent to you that I will work equally hard or harder down in the federal government to do good things for this country. For example, just two, three examples. Um, as a freshman legislator, I was able to amend the state budget to um, prevent my communities and other high-performing commission school districts from mandatory consolidation. This applied around the state to a handful of schools that really helped kids and communities and schools where consolidation was going to be uh, not good. And um, that was something that I worked across party lines. Um, then I took on the expansion of broadband in rural Maine. I championed the Broadband Strategy Council legislation. I was the chair of that uh, committee that ultimately led to 
through a minor project which has been identified by the United States Chamber of Commerce as being the best business infrastructure in the country. I sponsored the legislation that enabled this project to uh, move forward uh, by attaching fiber, uh, excuse me, fiber optic cables to telephone poles around Maine. And I encourage you just to um, stay tuned about that because that brings economic diversity and prosperity to parts of this state and, attack and connects Maine to the global economy. Uh, I was awarded by the Disability Rights Center for legislation that I championed to make Maine uh, a better place, a more fair place for people with disabilities. Um, I have the professional, the academic, the political experience um, to be a United States Senator, and I want very much for you to um, get to know me a little bit more. You can go to our website, which is www.cynthiadill.com, where there are policy positions and some information about my background that you might not have heard tonight. We're also very active on Facebook and Twitter. Um, on Facebook, it's Dill for U.S. Senate. On Twitter, my handle is Dill Esquire. I do have, I guess, a parody now, so I've arrived. Um, but it's mine, it's Dill Esquire. So, and in terms of, I would just like to address a concern very briefly about Angus King and the appearance now of an independent the anxiety that some people have because we may have a repeat of the location administration. And I would just say to you that make sure before you cast a vote for somebody hoping that they're going to vote one way or the other, that you press every candidate on where he or she stands on the issues. First and foremost, who would this person support as the leader of the United States Senate? That's a question that has to be answered by every single candidate, including the independents that are in the race. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Final closing statement, three minutes, 30 seconds, Mr. King. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Representative Adams. It was nice serving with you on the utility and energy as well. Uh, uh, this, uh, this opportunity doesn't come up that often to uh, fill the seat to the United States Senate. Uh, I think there's a number of considerations that uh, we should all keep in mind. Uh, certainly the state needs to be served well by whoever we send to the Senate. Uh, by served well, we need uh, a senate, senator that uh, works well in Washington and works well representing the state of Maine. I think that probably includes fighting for the state of Maine. Uh, you know, we've heard some fighting talk here, but uh, I've, I've got some good uh, fight in my background, and uh, I've never backed down from a, a, a battle when it has to be fought. Uh, I worked. On behalf of fishermen in the Exxon Valdez oil spill case, uh, on behalf of well owners in the state of Maine against the oil uh, giants over contamination with uh, MTBA, uh, working for Greenpeace, I went up against chemical companies and uh, in the Defense Department over nuclear waste dumping and any number of large uh, interests. They 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 don't um, frighten me. Um, they don't overly impress me. Uh, sometimes you, you need a fighter. But I think there's more to this election than that. I think uh, Maine has the opportunity, as it has done before, of sending somebody who could try and address the nation's problems. And part of them start with the U.S. Senate. And I will put those problems in two major categories. One of them was addressed by Olympia Snow when she left. And that's the lack <coughs> of, of cooperation and cooperation. It's partisanship and a divide that is paralyzing the Senate. I think she was right about that. But I also agree with uh, former Secretary Matt Dunlop that meeting in the middle is not the answer necessarily. Uh, too much of what has happened in our federal government has skewed the rules of the game so that it favors the wealthy, the powerful, those who have influence in Washington over ordinary working people. Our state is filled with ordinary working people. This is the way that Maine gets by. We don't have the high flyers and the uh, influence peddlers. Uh, Maine is a working state, and yet you find a, a federal government that is passing a tax landscape that puts people who are making money, moving money, earning millions of dollars, paying a lower tax rate than ordinary working people, than truck drivers, than secretaries. Uh, it's going to take a focus on that from a lot of senators to turn things around. But let's make sure the senator from Maine is willing to address these things, is aware of those problems, 
and still at the same time is able to work with people across party lines, whatever it takes to get the job done. I offer myself. Thank you. In closing, a round of applause for all of our candidates. In the vernacular of the day, the evening proves again that the depth of the bench is great. And whatever side of this table we've sat on this evening, I think we've proven once again, for one more night, in Portland, Maine, that democracy is safe. So thank you, Portland Club. Thank you, excellent timers. Thank you, candidates. Thank you, Mr. Gallant. 